Go ahead, Phil. Okay, so welcome everybody. You can sort of see on the screen right now a uh, written introduction to, to Pierre and what he's going to talk about. And in the next, when he puts up his slide presentation, there's going to be two other uh, pages, windows that have more detail on his background. But I wanted to give more of a personal background to Pierre. Uh, he's someone that I casually knew in the late 1970s when both he and I were employed by the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, with the turn in my life, I sort of uh, left uh, ecology and biology. I lost track of him and he of me for good reason. And between then and now, uh, we've not really met each other. However, this past fall, I was re reintroduced to him through online searching for information on environmental impacts of agricultural uses of pesticides on crops being grown in fields adjacent to our rural property. Once I digested his wealth of knowledge in this subject area, I determined that he was someone who would significantly add to KCOR members' knowledge on the topic of pesticide toxicology. Pierre today is talking to, his, to us from his home on Salt Spring Island, which is one of the wonderful coastal islands between Vancouver and uh, Vancouver Island and mainland British Columbia. Pierre has provided in the introduction to his presentation a very good summary of his background, so I'll be very brief from here on in. Pierre began his long and distinguished scientific career studying the effects of persistent organochlorine compounds like DDT and PCBs on fish eating birds. He became responsible for the Canadian assessment of new and existing pesticides to determine their adverse impacts on wildlife. In 1994, he tra transitioned from regulatory reviews to full-time research on the environmental impacts of pesticides achieving the rank of senior research scientist at Environment Canada. Working with international collaborators and graduate students, he continues to work on assessing global environmental footprints of pesticides. He also studies how birds are exposed to pesticides, how bird population respond to pesticide use, and the agricultural use of pesticides. Pierre officially retire, retired from public service in 2012 and now has his own private consulting company. Pierre has authored or co-authored over 200 technical papers, book chapters and reports, and presented at numerous scientific meetings or to governments, academic institutions, or NGOs. His work has been featured in many, many publications and in radio or television interviews in Canada, the US and Argentina. At his community level, on Salt Spring Island. Pierre is very active in the local photogra photography club and the Salt Spring Island Conservancy, in which he is currently its board of directors, vice president. And so with this brief introduction, I hope you all enjoy his presentation. And so Pierre, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Phil. And uh, we're no longer in share, I should go to share screen, right? Yes, please. Yep. Okay. So no, I'm going to be uh, muting myself and disappearing <laughs> from the screen too, Pierre, but I'll be here. Okay. Um, but you are seeing this, right? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Phil, and thank you for, for the invitation um, and the, the great introduction, um, which will probably mean that I can skip over uh, the next couple of slides uh, quite readily. So I want to talk today about neonics, neonicotinoid uh, insecticides, um, which <laughs> we could go in a uh, number of different directions. Uh, I want to speak specifically, end up spe speaking specifically about bats, uh, which is some work I did for the uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation a couple of years back, uh, because I think it raises some interesting uh, questions. Uh, but before we do, I, I want to also um, basically make you aware, I, I realize this is that KCOR is, is probably more of sort of a, you usually have policy discussions as much as anything else. And this might be much more into the weeds than, than 
you're used to in terms of a talk. Um, so I want to make sure that um, you're all with me as you go along. Uh, now, uh, Phil mentioned and Art said, if, if there's something that I say that totally blocks your enjoyment of the presentation, you think I've, I've skipped over something that was fairly critical, you can message uh, them and they can, they can always, I said, they, you know, I can be interrupted and, and, and deal with that question if it's really important. Otherwise, we'll have quite a long uh, discussion and, and question session uh, at the end, so you can just write down your question and ask it then. So, um, who am I? Um, as Phil mentioned, I started uh, my, my work career working on the Great Lakes, uh, persistent contaminants. This was the tail end of the uh, DDT era. In fact, I, I worked for a number of years to try to uh, ban the last uses of, of DDT. Uh, in Canada, which interestingly uh, was for bat control. That's a different story we can talk about later, but uh, uh, a bit ironic in, given the, the current talk. Um, for a number of years, I was actually part of the regulatory system in Canada, which was a, a multi-departmental system with the Department of Agriculture making decisions about which compounds should be allowed uh, in Canada and under what conditions. But the scientific review of the data behind those compounds was done by a number of quote unquote core departments, Environment Canada being one of those. Uh, so I was providing advice essentially from the, the, the point of view of Environment Canada to Agriculture Canada about registration of pesticides. Um, then uh, through a number of, of uh, pressures and, and changes, in governance, uh, the PMRA was created, the Pest uh, Management Regulatory Agency. Um, we were offered, my, my group, I was then the, the head of a section of five, six people, were offered uh, the, the possibility to, to join with this new agency to review uh, pesticides and continue doing the regulatory work. Uh, but taking one look at the, how it was being set up, uh, and also because of the very clear importance of pesticides to the mandate of Environment Canada, I argued that we needed to maintain uh, expertise in-house. And so I stayed with the Department of the Environment uh, until my, my retirement, moving on to be uh, a scientist and, and sort of you know, researching uh, the, uh, the compounds. A lot of that work was done uh, with collaboration of, of students. I have had uh, several adjunctships, primarily at uh, Carleton and Ottawa University uh, that have a joint program, uh, but also a few other universities uh, around the, the globe. And being part of the regulatory system did give me a very privileged view into the registration system in various countries, be that of uh, Europe. Europe was just setting up its pan-European uh, system at EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, also did some work at the time with the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA, uh, in the UK that had a very interesting, very different system. Uh, worked with uh, colleagues in Australia on, um, on, a, on a plague locust. Um, I had spent a fair bit of time working on our own grasshopper outbreaks over here. Um, because, of course, grasshoppers and locusts are, are, are key food uh, items for, for wildlife and when they're sprayed and things go awry. Uh, Argentina, different story there where we have massive uh, mortality of swings and hawks as a result of pesticides and I got involved with the researchers there and, and continued collaborating with them for, for a number of years. So let's just take a, take a step back here before we jump into to neonics and just talk about a little bit about pesticides uh, generally. So battling insects has, has been a long-standing issue of uh, humankind uh, right from the antiquities. Um, all sorts of methods we use to battle insect plagues from prayers to child labor, uh, sending your kids into the field to, to handpick uh, the pests. Uh, here you see some, some uh, individuals attempting to burn out uh, some pests. Uh, here is the detachment of uh, the military 
uh, clearing gypsy moth egg masses uh, from, from from these uh, these trees in, in in urban parks. And obviously, this was before the days of uh, workplace uh, safety. Uh, the, the fire is interesting because, of course, that's making a bit of a resurgence now. You can get uh, flamethrowers uh, on the back of uh, of a tractor to basically grill your potato beetles uh, in, in organic agriculture. Uh, as for that uh, grasshopper there, well, I mean, clearly uh, the issue of lead contamination in the environment um, uh, becomes an issue if you're going to have a real plague of locusts. Very early on, the, the ancient Chinese, the Greeks, um, were looking for various compounds with which to fight uh, insects and the, the threat that insects uh, uh, cause on their uh, the food supply. Botanical agents were used quite early on. Um, pyrethrum extracted from, from daisies, throat known from garris roots, uh, tobacco, uh, macerations, uh, various uh, ilk. And uh, of course, a number of metals were known, lead, arsenic, um, that uh, sprayer you see there on the bottom uh, right uh, actually was in the 1800s, uh, where Paris Green uh, arsenic compound was being applied to a potato field. Uh, I'll just mention pyrethrum, the, the, the daisy chemical, because it, uh, of course, it makes a comeback as a synthetic pyrethroid, which did become major use in insecticides in a number of countries, a little less so uh, in North America, um, but uh, they they were derived from from the uh, the original uh, pyrethrum. So I, I consider that to be sort of the first the first era of of, of uh, insecticides. Then we come to the one that people would probably recognize as as the birth of of, of insecticides, and that's the organochlorines uh, developed in the Second World War. Uh, originally by, by a Swiss scientist used and probably had a uh, fairly uh, important role to play in the Second World War because the Allies used it to uh, control typhus in the, in the trenches, uh, malaria and some of the, uh, especially the Pacific, Pacific theater. Uh, DDT, of course, was the least acutely toxic of the uh, organochlorines, the other ones being the cyclodienes, aldrin, gildrin, cordane, heptachlor. Um, quite a bit more acutely toxic. Uh, if you're old enough like me, you will probably remember uh, running around when they were fumigating with, with DDT on beaches and picnic uh, areas and so on. And there's tons of pictures on the net of kids running in and out of, of DDT um, smoke being, being applied. Now, the, the, the DDT was, was, was not uh, acutely toxic, but it, it did have, of course, the major disadvantage of being uh, of bioaccumulating and biomagnifying. So minute quantities of these hydrophobic uh, chemicals in water would accumulate up the food chain. And the impacts uh, that uh, we started seeing were primarily, not solely, but primarily in uh, individuals that were high on the food web, the ospreys, the eagles, the pelicans. Um, and of course, uh, that was um, one of the things that Rachel Carson, your pictures on the bottom left, uh, talked about in her book. Uh, and and at, some would argue this gave rise to the whole of the uh, the environmental uh, movement uh, and and, and our, our knowledge of, of pesticides. So uh, Rachel Carson. Uh, did not only talk about the organochlorines, and if you read Silent Spring, uh, her, her magnum opus, uh, you'll see that she was also decrying uh, some of the up and coming organophosphorus insecticides like, like parathion, because those were acutely toxic neurotoxin. And um, in, in a sense, we sort of jumped a little bit from the, the, the pan into, uh, into the fire the, the regulators, and I spoke to a number of them at the time, um, were so desperate to move away from bioaccumulating pesticides that they were basically willing to accept any level of toxicity uh, as replacements because of the, one of the key characteristics of the organophosphorus uh, and carbamate insecticides is that they were short-lived in the environment. But they made up uh, 
in toxicity in, uh, to, to a large extent. And this had disastrous consequences, uh, both to farm workers, there were large numbers of farm worker uh, deaths all over the world, especially, you know, in, in uh, underdeveloped countries where uh, the level of protection wasn't sufficient. Um, all you needed was a backpack sprayer on your, like this with a leak uh, in it, and basically the, the dermal contact was probably enough to send you to the hospital or, or, or kill you. And then one of the things, uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of the bystander effect, if you wish, uh, of the OPs was birds. Uh, birds uh, were more sensitive than mammals. It was toxic enough to mammals, but birds were exquisitely sensitive uh, as a group to the organophosphorus insecticides. And in fact, I spent most of my professional career assessing and trying to address uh, these, these impacts of uh, OP insecticides, uh, OP and carbamate insecticides on birds. And just as one example here, I spent quite a number of years going after one carbamate called carbofuran or furidan. Um, and uh, I estimated that, you know, you, one hectare of, of corn uh, basically carried the, the 41 million lethal dose equivalent for, for an average songbird. And I estimated that uh, the number of songbirds dying and this is based on U.S. data because, of course, Canada is not, is not collecting uh, use information, still does not collect use information to this date, a long-standing uh, bugbear of mine. But uh, one formulation of one insecticide was killing in, uh, songbirds by the tens of millions in one crop alone. So we're talking here about a, a fairly major uh, impact which, which was essentially why I argued uh, that Environment Canada, with its responsibilities for migratory birds, should maintain expertise uh, in pesticides. The, the one thing that I still find interesting to this day is that there wasn't more of an outcry. Now, here we're talking about uh, the 80s and, and sort of 90s. There is more, there's definitely more concern today about the fate of pollinators in our crops than there was about the fate of our songbirds uh, in those days. I still find that interesting. Of course, that wasn't the case. And um, I was uh, one of the reasons I associated myself with colleagues in the UK is that they actually cared about their birds and agriculture a lot more than we did here and, uh, and took measures quite early on to try to limit uh, the, the extent of mortality from those insecticides on crops. In Canada and the US, uh, virtually nothing uh, was done. Um, so we had, for decades and decades, we had our canola fields in, in Canada were being fertilized by the bodies of, of millions of migrant songbirds. So that's the, that's the, <laughs> The, uh, the world of, of, of insecticides leading up to current times. Uh, and in case you haven't noticed it, we've, we were in a totally new uh, era now where the neonicotinoids uh, reign uh, supreme. Neonics for short, um, they were introduced in, in the mid 90s and we can talk a little bit more about that introduction uh, a little later on because that's, that's an interesting story in itself. But their characteristics, excuse me, they are very toxic to a broad range of invertebrates. And here, uh, I mean not just terrestrial invertebrates, but aquatic ones as well, because the materials are extremely water soluble and very prone to runoff. So I, I'm not going to talk uh, much at all, if at all, about the aquatic impacts of neonics. That would be a totally separate uh, conversation. Uh, but they are, uh, they are massive. Uh, because of the way neonics are used, uh, basically now every, every bit of surface water that we have, uh, and is contaminated with neonics at a level that has the potential to affect, uh, the aquatic food chain. So it's, um, it, it's pretty serious in terms of overall contamination. Uh, I mean, a, a contamination probably in, on, the, on the level that we were seeing with organochlorines uh, in terms of, of spread, 
Uh, and that again is because of the way uh, they, they are used primarily. So not only are they very toxic to, to, to invertebrates, uh, but they are systemic. Uh, being systemic, and I'll cover that a little bit later, means they, they are absorbed and distributed into and, and through the plant. And they are very persistent. Uh, so with the organophosphorus insecticides, where we were talking about uh, half lives in soil of uh, 10, 20 days or so, uh, with a neonix, we're now looking at, in some cases, uh, months or years uh, of persistence in soils and the potential to build up uh, from year to year. And that's interesting because whereas uh, they're highly persistent while being very soluble, organochlorines were extremely persistent, but they were, were very um, hydrophobic, uh, lipid soluble. So you know, similar, but, but, but different. If you've heard of neonics, it's probably been in the context of bees and pollinators and um, certainly most of the restrictions and cancellations that you've seen around the world and currently in, in, in Europe are as a result of their impact on, on pollinators. So um, that being the primary source, people are still coming to grips with the fact that uh, the impacts on, on the aquatic system are, are, are huge. And, and will continue to be on until we change the way we use these, these products. Now, neonics um, attack the same um, pathways, neural pathways, as did the organophosphorus insecticide. But they are they are different. Uh, they are uh, agonists and um, considered to be somewhat safer, uh, definitely because of the specific. I don't, don't want to get fall into the, the really technical stuff, but the, 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 the neural connection that we have is slightly different. The, the receptors are slightly different uh, than those in insects. There's a fair bit of crossover, of course, uh, but as a result, if you, when you just look at the acute toxicity of the product, they are the safer uh, than the opiates. You're certainly are not likely to have uh, farm workers uh, dropping dead in their tracks uh, from from a, from a neonic, whereas that was very uh, possible with a number of DOPs they were using. So I mentioned systemic activity. Um, it's not a new concept. Uh, there were a number of OPs that were uh, that were systemic. There's, there's, there's been there's sort of every every insecticide group. Well, not every, but a number of insecticides uh, in use before it did have some systemic activity. Now systemic activity is useful if you want to, to control uh, uh, either a, a, a biting, sucking, chewing uh, insect. Uh, and in theory, on the surface, it, it sounds like a good thing. You're gonna have your insecticide in the crop, in the plant, um, so that when a, uh, an insect pest comes along and, and, and attacks the plant, then it's gonna get a dose of, of, of the, the insecticide and, and die or be slowed down. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite totally work out that way in the sense that a lot of the compound never makes it into the plant, stays in the soil, and in this case, is very prone to, to, to run off. Uh, even if it was a perfect solution, having the insecticide in all parts of the plant becomes in itself problematic. So not only are you uh, then targeting the uh, chewing insect that's going to attack the foliage of your crop, but you're potentially affecting the pollinator that is going to be attracted to the nectar and the pollen produced by the crop. Then the crop itself becomes loaded with the, the, the product, although uh, albeit by that time when you get some growth dilution. And then so you've got the whole issue of companion cropping, rotational crops, uh, what do you do with the, the, the crop residues and, and, and mulching, so on. So, so it's a very different way of, of thinking about the use of insecticides and, and also much more difficult, say, to protect uh, your local bees or pollinators, which typically with, with more toxic uh, insecticides was done through uh, withdrawal. So you wouldn't um, spray at the time of flowering or you would spray at night uh, if it was a very short-lived compound, hoping that most of the residues would be dissipated by, by morning, which May or may or may not have worked, but that was the that was the theory, and that was how um, 
insecticides were handled in crops to try to minimize the impact on pollinators. But of course now it's there 24-7 uh, and therefore uh, even if material was applied many months before flowering, it still pops up in the pollen and the pollen and uh, nectar at, at flowering time. So it's quite a bit much more different um, uh, different in terms of a problem. Now, there was a real appeal to to neonics. Uh, so I so I've titled it the the siren song or or the perfect storm because of course from my point of view they're they're the perfect storm. They're the perfect storm because of the combination of, of high toxicity, high persistence, and high water solubility. And those three things uh, make them very problematic. From the point of view of the regulators, uh, of course, they, were, they proved very appealing because by the time neonics showed up, there was already growing evidence that, um, well, never mind the birds, which, which, which we knew uh, in terms of impact, uh, human uh, impacts were were sort of being you know, were growing, and specifically the realization that um, minute residues of, of OPs um, being fed to children affected their neural development, and there were even some papers produced where they could correlate uh, residues in uh, umbilical cord and cord blood uh, with with the IQ of the children. I mean, it was it was. <laughs> It's becoming quite evident that the extent of use of OPs as a class, uh, and this is the, this is the other aspect, is that there were dozens and dozens of those products registered for all sorts of, of different commodities, and nobody had bothered to ask, well, what is the what is the combined impact of those residues uh, to children and food supply in general? Um, because they all essentially acted in, in, in the same way. So, so that's the, the FQPA, which is a U.S. construct Food Quality Protection uh, Act, which mandated uh, EPA for the first time to look at the aggregate impact uh, of, of insecticides. And that's when it became apparent that they had to reduce uh, OP use. And then the old NICS came along and they said, hallelujah. Um, that's that's our salvation. The other the other thing that was evident is that OPs were no longer um, uh, working very well by then. Being, there being a lot of pest resistance issues, uh, and you know we had you had to use an increasing uh, levels with increasing frequency, and that just just wasn't uh, well, economically viable, let alone environmentally or or, or health wise. Industry had a big influence in promulgating this new class of compounds, of course. Industry has always had a, a big influence on, on regulators. And uh, there's a lot of really good examples of that with neonics. When the first neonics that came out, essentially, well, the first one was even the uh In Canada, for instance, when it came out, it was going to be used on potatoes. And the only reason being that uh, Colorado potato beetle, uh, there, were, there were resistance issues. Having said that, uh, I talked to a number of agronomists at the time who didn't want to see neonics come on to the scene because they had managed potato farming with the farming community to use integrated pest management principles uh, and, and use them, uh, basically coach them along on how to live with the pest um, in the absence of adequate control because the OPs uh, weren't working anymore anyway. And they were they were shocked when when neonics came around because overnight everything that the farmers had learned about IPM disappeared. It was basically uh, the solution in a box, and it truly was a solution uh, in a box. Uh, the other the other uh, thing I might add is that if you look at the, some of the early assessments of of neonics, the aquatic impacts were well realized, uh, but uh, the some of the evaluations I saw said, well, well, that's okay. We can we can still allow the products in because they tell us that they're only going to be using it in greenhouse. <laughs> when you look at uh, the situation today and you realize that there probably is not a single crop 
uh, grown anywhere in the world that doesn't have a Munich registration. You realize just how much uh, industry influence there was behind these Munich registrations. I, when I said solution in the box, I meant just that. Uh, by then, the most of the chemical manufacturers controlled the uh, seed stock uh, for agricultural crops. They had bought into uh, mo most of the seed uh, producers, so they therefore controlled both the seed and the chemicals that were uh, applied to the crops. So Neonex proved absolutely perfect because you could actually put them right onto the seed and therefore sell both of your products at the same time and you know double double your money. Now, on the good side, from a farmer's point of view, they were a lot less acutely toxic, especially in if they were uh, coated on seed and so on, you didn't have to handle the liquid. But even if you did, uh, you weren't going to die. You, you didn't go home with a headache at the end of the day and uh, you, weren't let, you were gonna die if you spilled uh, some of the material uh, on yourself. It was new chemistry, so therefore there was no, no pest out there had a resistance to it, so they worked like gangbusters. And uh, because of they were systemic, they did work on difficult to get a pest. And that, you know, that has a, a good, that is one of the good sides of a systemic. And that in some cases we were down to treating crops, especially crops that you don't eat where you don't care about the residues like cotton. Every, every five or six days spraying them with really hard hitting uh, OP, which of course had devastating consequences for the environment. But that is what you had to do because of both resistance and, for instance, if you were dealing with a pest that had uh, emergence uh, that was delayed, where not all of the pests will emerge at the same time. So now you didn't have to treat repeatedly. You could just treat once and allow the chemical to work uh, systemically. Industry, of course, uh, loved it because, as I said, they controlled the seed market. And now they also controlled uh, the, uh, the the pesticide that went on them. And because they were systemic, they managed to convince everyone that the best thing to do was to put it on a seed and treat the uh, entire crop acreage as an insurance, um, rather than merely where they were uh, needed. And so principles of integrated pest management <laughs> went completely out, out of the window because every acre of every crop, or at least for a lot of the major crops, uh, were being treated. So, of course, that made a lot of money because you sell a lot of product, made all the, the shareholders of those companies very happy. And here, uh, with, with uh, no humility whatsoever, I'll talk about Pierre's law of pesticide impacts uh, and something I've been able to, to, to see over my 40-plus my, uh, years of experience in the field, that whether, well, speaking specifically here of environmental damage, the, the extent of damage that you see is probably directly proportional to the popu popularity of a product. So you could have a product that is actually, that could be problematic, and but if used wisely and in only, you know, where it's absolutely needed, in many cases, the environmental impact could be lessened or, or brought down to an acceptable level. The problem comes when companies get greedy and of course want to use their product on every acre of every crop. And, and we should just make a little aside here is that products like this is what they're looking for. So there's, because of the cost of research, development, uh, safety testing and all of this, it does not pay for companies to market insecticides that are specific to a particular insect pest. The technology is there. We can do it with viruses. We can do it with fungi, bacteria. And, and we see some of these products, notably in forestry, where there has been a, a large input of, uh, of, of uh, resources from the public purse to, uh, to do the research and, and development of these products. But essentially, the companies, the pesticide companies out there are not interested in putting compounds on the market unless that compound can be used in the majority of the world's food crops and a lot of the important 
pests on those uh, food crops. So by definition, you start with a product that has a very broad reach in terms of the number of species it's going to affect. All right, just take a little drink here. So it became uh, apparent uh, quite soon that um, beekeepers keeping their, their, their bees uh, in fields uh, near where neonics were used, whether it be corn or uh, other crops, were, were seeing huge levels of mortality in their hives. And um, in some cases, it was, uh, say, cornfields, and, you know, because corn corn is wind pollinated and wasn't thought to be attractive to pollinators it became a little bit of a of a quandary and we had to re-examine uh just how exposure was was happening uh for, for pollinators and had to look at things like uh, glutation water which is the the little transpiration uh droplets that you see on the edges of, of leaves on on on, on sort of cool uh mornings um again having a systemic um product in the plant meant that you had horrendous concentrations of that insecticide in the glutation water and a lot of insects use that uh, as, as drinking supply. So we had to really look at the whole exposure aspect. The, the specific exposure tended to be you know deposit uh, before with a, with a classical uh, insecticide. It was either deposit on the insect directly or deposit say on, on a stamen uh, or on a pistol uh, for when 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 the uh, the insect or the bee came to the flower, but things became very different. Another thing that became apparent is that again, because neonics were used uh, on on feed a lot of the time, is the amount of dust that was created while crops were being seeded. So when you have uh, the the chemical that's just sitting coating uh, the seed, uh, especially with uh, pneumatic seeders it was found that the, 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 the toxic uh, cloud of dust uh, coming out from behind the planting equipment was responsible for, for a lot of problems uh, and uh, ranged quite far from the field as well. So skipping over uh, a, a decade uh, or, uh, or two, then all of a sudden, you know, you start, we're starting to see more evidence in the literature that yes, neonics, uh, certainly in agricultural landscapes are a key factor in insect declines. And if you're, uh, you're probably aware of that as well, there have been a number of, uh, of reports that uh, insects are in decline. Uh, we're, lo we're not only losing species, we're just losing uh, total biomass, and that decline is affecting uh, the, the food chain and the, uh, the wildlife that depends on them, such as insectivorous birds. And uh, so there's now good evidence, and this is evidence um, related to the aquatic contamination in the Netherlands, where uh, insectivorous birds were clearly being affected by the decline in a number of key uh, insect species. So then oftentimes in discussion, the, the question would come about saying, well, you know, what about other insectivorous uh, wildlife? And what about bats? And bats, uh, of course, are uh, in the, the consciousness right now of, of biologists because of the disease, the white nose syndrome uh, that they have that's sort of moving from, from the East Coast to moving our way uh, year by year, uh, which has a totally decimated uh, once uh, uh, very um, prolific, or uh, word I'm looking for, uh, yeah. <laughs> A species, a, not a very common species that we had, such as, you know, uh, Myotis lucifagus, a little brown bat, very common bat species, which is now uh, officially on the endangered uh, species list in Canada, uh, largely because of white nose uh, syndromes. So we could predict, based on the data uh, on, on insect impact, the data on uh, the effect that ha that has had on insectivorous birds, we could predict that bats would be hit through the food supply. And there's, there's, you know, if you look at the biology of, of bats, 
you realize that they are uh, very much dependent on high densities of insects. So any one bat species is fairly broad in terms of the number of insects that they can take, uh, and the, and more they look at bat um, uh, food habits, the more they, they realize that there's a very large breadth of insects that are taken. But they, they're very much opportunistic, and they have a very energetic way of, of catching insects, and they therefore need a very high rate of success uh, in order to, to succeed. So it's quite likely that what we, that the, the, the uh, drops in insect uh, populations are going to, to affect the bats. But then the other question came up is that, well, do we need to worry about the direct effects on bats? Are neonics really as safe to mammals as they were touted to be? Um, there was reports, uh, you know, in the intervening time, there have been reports coming out uh, of places like Japan, where uh, doctors are seeing patients coming in uh, with tremors, with heart palpitations, and effects which uh, have been linked to their intake of neonics because because the neonics were used on so many of the, the, the crops they were um, uh, ingesting and taking in, uh, including things like tea, uh, you know, that uh, they're, even though they're less acutely toxic, they're still not, not without effect. So when you think about bats and the way they catch insects and a neurotoxin, you immediately have to ask yourself, well, how, you know, uh, it probably doesn't take much to uh, throw a bat off uh, of its uh, normal feeding habits. Bats have a very interesting life history study and of course uh, go through um, fat accumulation in order to, to winter. Uh, they shut down and during hibernation, shut down some of their key systems like their immune systems. Uh, so they, they have a number of characteristics that you know in their lifestyle that might make them actually quite vulnerable to, to a neurotoxic uh, chemical. When assessing the, the impact of any pesticide to wildlife, uh, unfortunately, we're still stuck in the an old paradigm that the acute toxicity is really the, the only thing that matters. And the LD50, which is the lethal dose, so 50% of the uh, population you give your, your product to, is really runs all the wildlife risk assessments. But there's lots of evidence that that isn't sufficient to protect wildlife. Uh, I mean, even in the uh, in the bat world, for instance, some some laboratory work that was done, you can show that you can impair the flight ability uh, of a bat um, at a level of, of dosing that is you know, less than 10 times what it would take to actually uh, kill it. So, so relying on the, uh, the lethal dose uh, clearly does not safeguard the ability of a bat to, to forage. And we saw this also uh, with birds, uh, with, uh, for instance, we had, uh, I worked for a number of years on a spruce budworm uh, control program in New Brunswick where we were using phenytrophion, which is an organophosphorus insecticide, where uh, we predicted horrendous mortality uh, from the uh, treatment uh, in the, uh, the spruce plantation, not from necessarily from acute toxicity, but because you had a lot of small birds that were basically incapacitated for sometimes a number of hours by uh, an early morning spray of the insecticide. And when you have something like a, a little kinglet, for instance, that needs to eat continuously in order to survive, uh, has to go into torpor at night in order to survive that night and start feeding again the next day, you stop it from feeding for two or three or four hours and it's as good as dead. And uh, I'm quite convinced that most of the impact we were seeing was actually not from 
causing mortality directly, but causing mortality indirectly through uh, stopping them from, from, from feeding. And, and in fact, I think one could argue that the same would, would be uh, true for, for a bat. Uh, if you look at neonics, they're spread between lethal dose and neurotoxic deficits. Again, it's quite, it's quite large. That little box there on the bottom right, I, I, I'm sort of missing not having a pointer here because it makes it so easier, so much easier. But actually, let me ask you a question. Do you see my arrow? Yes, it's visible. Oh, excellent. I do have a pointer. Okay. So, yeah, so in rats, uh, whereas, you know, you take take a, a neonic and uh, I think that's for neonicoprid, you would have, uh, this is the lethal dose in milligram per kilogram body weight in an individual, you can start seeing deficits way, 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 way earlier. Uh, so so I, I would argue that we have to reassess how we look at the impact of uh, pesticides on wildlife to talk not necessarily of them dropping dead on our tracks, but being impaired and being prevented from going about the normal business of feeding and avoiding uh, predators. So um, what I did essentially for the um, uh, Wildlife Federation is went through all of the mammalian toxicology corpus. And this is the, the data that are submitted by industry to the US EPA, the PMRA, the California EPA, European Food Safety Authority. You basically go, go through all of the regulatory studies. And because these studies are not publicly available, but the summaries from these agencies are. Uh, by the time I, I thought, by the time I had looked at four different regulatory agencies, I could be more or less assured that there was sort of an even uh, consideration of the, the data. Now it's still limited by the, the, the design of those tests, but nevertheless, that information is what actually runs uh, the pesticide regulatory system from the point of view of human health assessment. And what I was looking for specifically were uh, endpoints that were associated, in this case, this is typically what you saw as the first thing uh, at the lowest dose were neurotoxic effects. So motor uh, neuron effects, things that would, would really impair with the bat's uh, ability uh, to feed. Neural development, neurotoxicity, some endocrine and organ toxicity, but the really interesting ones to me were neurotoxicity effects, especially on the on an acute basis. In uh, doing an assessment, uh, you know that there's a vast difference in how different species respond to the same chemicals. So, so I used a, a, a safety factor here of, of tenfold, although you'll see that that wasn't uh, even necessary. The if you're interested in this work, by the way, it's the subject of a report um, that I did, and I can I can put out the uh, uh, the URL for it. It's available uh, on the web, and you'll get all the gory details. So I'm running quickly through it, but all this to say that there's a lot of reports in the literature uh, about effects um, at levels that are much lower than those accepted by regulatory authorities. The problem is that there study designs that are kind of one of and and uh, difficult for regulatory authorities to to deal with and incorporate into their risk assessment uh, so they they generally only use the information that is supplied to them uh, according to a set format that's been dictated and that industry uh, has to follow when they when they report their data but you can it's it's not difficult to go through the literature and find reports uh, of effects uh, at levels that are lower than the reference doses that I ended up choosing. So, so from many and many many points of view, what I'm reporting here is probably an underestimate of the uh, potential impact. So, again, you know, here's some examples of motor effects at levels that were 15 times lower than those reported in industry studies. Uh, immun immuno uh, Toxicological effects, uh, lipogenesis uh, within the corporate, which um, you know, creating obesity in uh, in in, in uh, rats. I can't remember if this was rats or mice, but no matter in in a, one of the murine species, interesting uh, effect in the sense that we know just how uh, significant uh, lipid handling and accumulation is to bats. A lot of things you see in the literature also 
are non-monotonic effects. And those, those are effects. You see that with um, uh, stimulant pathways, cellular pathways, uh, as well as in the case of some, some, some behavioral uh, data. Uh, non-monotonic effect is where you don't have a clear dose response. So, you know, since the days of paracelsis, regulatory toxicology has relied on the fact that the dose makes the poison. Um, you have a small dose and a small effect. You have a larger dose, a larger effect. Income effects, which don't work that way. So signaling pathways, uh, cellular pathways, may be affected at a low concentration of the compound and then simply shut down or uh, necrose at, at a higher level. So the, the, the effect, the, the, the uh, downstream effect is not seen at a higher level. So that, that, uh, that raises a lot of difficulties for, uh, for regulators on how to deal with those, uh, those reports. But there are some very interesting uh, uh, research reports that indicate that uh, neonicotinoids behave in many ways uh, as do as does nicotine and cigarette smoking. And you know, it was recommended that uh, pregnant women stop smoking for for a number of reasons, and uh, that some of these effects uh, on on uh, sexual development, uh, aggression, uh, anxiety. And again, the other issue here for a regulator is mm, how do you deal with anxiety? Um, so we're going to have a number of anxious bats flying around. Um, how 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 is that going to be considered? But anyway, uh, I, I'm being facetious. But it's the regulatory toxicology tends to be very conservative, and in, in its outlook. So I decided to follow uh, the same suit because I wanted to have something out there that might convince some of those uh, regulatory toxicologists maybe they should take a second look. So it doesn't matter what the values are, but uh, I was able to, for a number of the key uh, neonicotinoids and based on this corpus of mammalian literature, uh, which I painstakingly reviewed uh, and summarized, I uh, was able to come up with what I call a reference dose, which was the level at which one would expect to start seeing effects. Only one data point for bats somewhere less than 20 milligram per kilogram was found to uh, impair flight in, in one experiment. Uh, that is you know, suitably above any of the, the numbers I have there, but again, it's below this level. And uh, you know, we don't, we, A, we don't know that it's all bad, and we don't know um, whether that actually uh, was, was the, the, the most sensitive effect I've seen. Now, okay, now so you, a risk assessment, which, which is what I'm presenting right now, is based on two things. One is the effect that you expect to see. The one is the exposure. Now, on the exposure side, of course, bats eat insects. And, uh, you know, there, there's an argument being made that, well, if an insect has been uh, affected by an insecticide, uh, well, it's not going to be as mobile or flying around and less likely to be caught. Uh, by by a predator, and there, there's there's some truth to that. Uh, but of course, there's always a lag time. Uh, the, it may make the insect, in fact, <laughs> uh, easier to catch if it's if it's merely uh, impaired, um, or it, the insect may be resting and zonked out on a leaf somewhere. And we know that bats do a lot of their foraging. Bats do a lot of foraging in the air, but they also do a lot of gleaning uh, off uh, leaf surfaces. So I will spare you the gory details here. They're, they're in the report. But needless to say, for the last 30 years, there's been this ongoing debate about what insect residue level should you apply in uh, wildlife risk assessment. Uh, because the, the, the data range over several orders of magnitude. You want to use uh, a number that is protective enough, but it is not so scary that every compound is going to fail evaluation in the minds of the of the regulators. So, so I spent a fair bit of time looking through the that literature, uh, the, the the and I, and I document the seesaw between sort of the regulatory levels. Industry would come in, 
commission a number of studies that would say, oh, no, 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 those levels are way too exaggerated. We think you should use this number in your calculations. And it would go back and forth, back and forth. It's probably come to a reasonable, um, reasonable number now. And so you've got a you've got a residue in your insect, and you have to ask, well, how much is the bat going to to eat in insects per day? And you can do some calculations based on its uh, metabolic rate here, the field metabolic rate, uh, where they you know they still put uh, uh, various methods of, of obtaining these numbers. But there's formulas out there. Um, you deduct uh, the amount of moisture in the insect content. Uh, because what the bat is after, of course, is, is, is energy. And then you come up with a scenario. And I did here, so for, for instance, uh, for an acute exposure, uh, an active small myotis uh, bat species probably eats about 125% of its body weight in insect, uh, in fresh uh, insect per day. Um, and then uh, over the course of a whole summer, uh, I worked it out to 74% of its body weight. And then uh, amortizing for uh, hibernation, uh, about 41% for the whole year. But it, I, I'm not, I'm not as happy with a uh, this is amortization process. But I mean, I think this is the main ones here that I'll present is like the the, the, the full fledged uh, act, active bat. So this is a lot of information for one slide, but I just want to go through the principle, and then I'll I've summarized some of the key points in in, in graphs. Um, so you take the active ingredient, how it's used, and how it's used will have a definite impact on, well, it's applied at different rates depending on how, how it's used, uh, and it will give rise to different uh, insect residue levels. So you work out what is the uh, residue on an insect that has been um, exposed to this agricultural spray, and then you ask a foraging bat here, taking 125% of its mass per day in insect, what is going to be uh, its residue intake per day, and then you compare that to the reference dose, which again is supposed to be the level at which you're going to start seeing impact. And what you end up with uh, is called an exposure toxicity ratio, which is simply that over that. Uh, so it's the residue um, intake over your reference dose. And it tells you whether or not you've exceeded the level of exposure at which you think you should start seeing effect. So in theory, you don't want to see numbers here that are above one. And in fact, as you can see, you do. And I've got I've got these here uh, on on a bar graph here. So those same uh, uses. And in fact, all of them for acute scenario. So this is a scenario of a uh, small myotis bat species feeding in an agricultural landscape where insects have been contaminated by the uh, pesticide application. And in every case, uh, you exceed your level of concern, in some cases by, by over a hundredfold. If you just look at the uh, residue in milligram per kilogram, we can relate this back to, remember, the slight impairment in our uh, bat, which is the only bit of toxicology that we have for bat species. Um, they tested 20 milligram per kilogram. And after the second day of that dose, and essentially it was almost instantaneous, they started seeing impairment uh, in the ability of that bat uh, to feed itself uh, in a uh, in a flight chamber. And as you can see, 20 milligram per kilogram is exceeded in most of the Canadian use scenarios uh, that I looked at. If you look at some along. So in, in looking at the subchronic exposure, uh, the, the reference level is a bit lower because you're looking at uh, uh, effects that may manifest upon chronic dosing. But then the insect level that you plug into the equation is a lot less uh, because you're, you, you don't have insects that are exposed on the day of application to your, to your agricultural field, but in fact reflect 
a, um, a level of contamination that is there throughout, say, the growing season of your crop. So you're, 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 tra you're, you're, you're playing with both sides of the equation, uh, and sometimes it's always a bit of a uh, surprise as to what you get at the end when you, 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 you make your, your ratio. But here again, uh, for some long exposure of that, uh, again, in an agricultural landscape where, where those compounds are used, um, well, I, I'll, I'll go back on that. Geonics are not merely used in agricultural landscapes. Uh, they're massively used uh, on lawn. Uh, they're massively used uh, in pet shampoos, and, and they have other uses, which mean that a lot of water bodies uh, near urban centers are very heavily contaminated. Uh, as well, so that the there you know there there's there, there's contamination be be seen uh, in in aquatic insects and in uh, uh, in areas even away from agriculture. But I I look primarily at agricultural scenarios. But the ETR ratio again is is above one, which to me says you know you know maybe we should take another look at uh, the potential for neonics to cause uh direct toxicological effects we, we know they have massive indirect effects through removal of 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 insect and uh insect and other invertebrate prey uh but we also need to look at it another way so so i'll i'll i'll, I'll stop there and, and take questions but i uh, in conclusion i think that our complacency vis-a-vis -vis the the uh, toxicity of neo neonicotinoid insecticides is misplaced. Yes, they're a lot less acutely toxic than the OPs were. It does not mean that they're devoid of acute toxicity that could affect our wildlife. It follows that bats foraging <laughs> over agricultural landscapes, in my view, are potentially at risk, which is not good news given that how badly Bats are doing it for for all sorts of reasons, and the fact that bats bats are actually recognized to be quite effective uh, pest control agents. So you put that with the fact that neonics are used over most of our farmlands. The EU recently being the exception because they've banned a number of of most of the the uses. In fact, so there there is definitely a reason for concern, especially in the way we slosh these compounds around. And the way that the uh, the farmland um, has you know 24 seven, and then again, these direct effects in bats are in addition to the indirect effects we suspect must be there because it's clear that insects are declining, and that part of that decline uh, now is being sort of you know the decline of least in agricultural well even not so agricultural environments is exacerbated by uh, by neonic insecticides. So I'll, I'll stop that, uh, stop there, Phil, and uh, take any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Pierre. I have a sneaking oh, suspicion. I, Go ahead. Well, I, I would just say, uh, again, if you're interested in the full story, the full story, so what I presented today is, is largely in that last report for the uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation. I've done a number of reports uh, over the years that talk about birds and aquatics and sea treatments and insects and, and more aquatics, uh, largely done for various um, US-based NGOs. I, I have to say that I left, I left government at the time that neonics were first coming up uh, initially for uh, potatoes. And as I said, there were a lot of concerns already uh, and, uh, in those days, about their use in potatoes. Now, since then, they have become ubiquitous. So, since retiring, uh, a lot of the work that I've done for, for NGOs is to go through and continue to do the analysis of the uh, emerging science on neonics from a number of different points of view. And that's that's you know you you can knock yourself out and get uh, much of the detailed story as as you want if you go through those reports. Okay, so just a quick reminder of what my role is. Um, I'm going to be the person that asks the questioners or commenters to turn on their 
video and their sound. And I'll do that a couple of spots before it's your turn. And I may ask a question of the presenter about their background before they begin, just so that the rest of us have some background as to where they're coming from. I have uh, 15 questions listed. And oh, I just see a couple more that have been added. So we're up to 17. Um, and so I think that we're going to be able to get all of the questions in in the rest of the time that we have for recording. And then as further information for those people at the end of the recording time, we do have a hangout where people can hang around and ask Pierre further questions. He's indicated that he's in no hurry to uh, get out and cut the lawn or whatever like that. So that uh, he'll he'll be here for that sort of more personal question period. Um, when I announce your uh, up next, that will be the time that you turn on your video and your uh, microphone. So the first three speakers are going to be Meg Sears, Cheryl McComsey, and Ruth Waldick. So Meg, would you ask your question now, please? Uh, we still you. got okay go <laughs> thank you so much pierre it's really good to see you again hi um, meg yeah nice to see you again yes yes we've been following with great admiration the international work and so on so thank you very much um there i, I actually made a few comments and so on um first of all talking about the uh you know, the long term toxicity of original, you know, some of the older pesticides, um, cadmium and mercury are actually um, <clears throat> major problems on golf course greens and in orchards. And in Washington State, cadmium has to be checked before you can do anything else on an old orchard. Yeah, um, mercury, uh, mercury is a major moss uh, killing agent uh, on, on turf. Uh, massive amounts of contamination there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been, our, our group did a, a report on pesticides and golf courses. And after that, we've been called to um, look at a few situations and the golf course in Canada that um, is, you know, kind of being contemplated for development and before courts and it's very complicated. I'm not, I haven't followed it, um, but they did have mercury, um, contamination there and there's mercury contamination in some places in Washington state that we've been contacted about. So um, yeah, th but this is about the um, neonics. So these are fairly large chemicals, like fairly large molecules compared to some of the earlier ones. And um, so I was just wondering, um, we've been interested in some of the breakdown products because these are not even acknowledged sometimes by yeah. the PMRA, let alone assessed. So um, like with imidacloprid, um, one of the breakdown products would be 2-chloropyridine, which could be um, fairly toxic and being chlorinated right next to the nitrogen, it would be fairly um, stable. So I was wondering if you'd looked into some of these other um, breakdown products and accumulation of not the parent compound, but mm -hmm. Um, some of the others in only as much as they were identified so depending on the legislation and Europe is better at this than North America if if uh, there is a breakdown product um, that represents and I can remember the percentage I think more than five percent or something like that of the parent then it has to be considered a potential toxic also and then a battery of tests is done so you you will have some at least basic toxicology tests on those compounds. So in some cases, yes. Um, in the majority of, of cases, uh, the, the, the parent compound was more toxic. Now, there are some interesting uh, exceptions to that. Um, in some cases, the compound may be a little less toxic, but there may be a little less, and less differential between its toxicity to invertebrates and to... Uh, to mammalian uh, receptors, so so that becomes interesting. Some compounds 
Uh, it's been shown recently that some uh, metabolites are formed uh, through chlorination uh, um, in, in water plants. So that's interesting and nobody knows anything about uh, the toxicity of those chlorinated uh, neonic compounds. Of course, the biggest um, breakdown that takes place is uh, two of the major ones, uh, thiomethoxam and chlorothionidin. Um, basically, thiomethoxam breaks down to about 60% chlorothionidin. One would argue that it's, it's a, it's a pro-pesticide um, and that uh, the, the effective agent there is chlorothionidin. That, that made it all the much more uh, ridiculous when EPA came out and said they were not going to do a, uh, an FQPA type uh, assessment on neonics, which, as I mentioned with the OPs, says that you look at every molecule that acts in the same way in order to look at the combined effect of those molecules on your, on your uh, receptors. Uh, and <laughs> I had to shake my head and say, what do you mean that you're not going to do a joint assessment when they were so clearly uh, similar and one breaks into a, you know, one derives from another. And they were saying, in fact, there's, there, they have different modes of action. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little strange. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's this, this. Um, you, you have talked a lot about OPs, and certainly there's, you know, they're they're well known to be incredibly neurotoxic and can affect children before they're even born with lifelong neuro neurological um, impacts. Um, in Canada, uh, one of the remaining. Uh, um, OPs is chlorpyrifos, which has recently been um, deregistered, but the PMRA is continuing its allowed use for three years. So our group and another group, Safe Food Matters, is being represented by Eco Justice in Court, challenging this three-year phase out. With your international knowledge, what is the um, you know, PMRA says, oh, but you know, otherwise there's uh, you know, no way of getting rid of it and so on. So we just have to distribute it amongst all the, the farm fields in order to, this is their disposal method. Um, but with your international knowledge, can you comment on Canada's three-year phase out, the risk of dumping of pesticides from other countries and how that compares with international practices? Mm. Yeah, I, that's, that, that's a big question. I'm not sure maybe we could get into all the, you know, chlorpyrifos is one of the OPs that seems to have survived through the, uh, the, the OP purges <laughs> uh, that have happened over the last 20 years. I, I don't fully understand why, because in my, in my books, it probably shouldn't have never been registered the way it was. Um, and I spoke to, uh, in fact, the chemical engineer who I think invented chlorpyrifos at Dow, and he he was also shaking his head and didn't think that the product should be used in the way it was being used either. Here, um, could, could could we move on? We've got fifteen other questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's move down on Meg because chlorpyrifos so is a big is a big 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 topic. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about the, the phase out period internationally. Thanks so much. But phase outs are always a big issue. You end up with this disposal issue. Now, you know, I mean, I think in a lot of cases, it could be a little more aggressive in forcing companies to, to take the stock back. Uh, but the argument is that, of course, by the time all of the stock is in through the, the, the retail sector, then there's all of this material to be disposed of. And I'm not sure that in reality it's that bad because pesticides tend to be, you know, they tend to stock up in the winter for the following spring type of thing at the, at the retail level. So I think that's exaggerated, frankly, that, but that's my personal opinion. Okay, so Cheryl, you're up next. And uh, could you do a brief introduction of where you're coming from? So I, uh, your question? I live on the West Coast of BC now, but, um, and I want to thank Pierre for his work because he's, done some very interesting analysis here that's quite useful. Um, so my background is um, actually in medical microbiology as a technologist for many years, but I came into this um, from uh, living in a city where uh, 
and it's interesting, uh, Meg is bringing this up, uh, chlorpyrifos was abused actually, according to federal and provincial regulations and was never, it was never addressed for many years. So I'm pretty familiar with that one. But uh, my question is more around, um, I think we create a lot of problems um, and then we uh, try to justify the use of pesticides. So my question is more about the big picture. I thought um, Meg mentioning breakdown products was um, really important, but also there's a synergistic impact with pesticides that's not even looked at either. So I've noticed that there's some studies coming out on um, synergistic impact of neonix and glyphosate that affects uh, deer quite serious um, impacts. And of course, if they're affecting deer, they're probably affecting our own um, populations. So I, I guess I look at the big picture that we create problems because for example, in forestry, we're transitioning from a forest to tree plantations, which is causing the problems of insects in these, these uh, areas because you have one kind of tree, you're gonna have a problem with insects. So I'm looking at the big picture of why don't we look at how we create these problems and how um, living with insects is actually a reality that we just don't seem to be able to accept. And what you think of that? I, I know that's a big question too. It is um, a big question. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it becomes, you know, uh, it's the same in farming. It doesn't have to be a tree plantation all over farm fields. Um, growing the, you know, the same crop over vast acreages in many cases, uh, we've picked uh, crop uh, varieties that uh, are high performing, uh, give us, you know, the high protein level or whatever it is that we we want at the expense of of, of uh, resistance to, to to fungi, resistance to insects. Um, yeah, so you know, it, it's it's you have to go back and have a whole discussion about the green revolution, the pros and the cons, and you know, which is basically the, the three-legged stool of, of performing uh, crop varieties, tons of fertilizer and tons of pesticides. And whether uh, that, you know, I mean, you know, there are statistics that show that, uh, yes, we are producing more kilocalories that way than we might uh, not otherwise, but at what cost? Um, and, and is that really essential? And could we not try to solve issues of, of uh, world hunger through uh, a more, you know, less waste and uh, more equitability uh, rather than this, this sort of industrial paradigm that we're stuck in. But you're, you're quite right. I mean, we, we've caused the issue and it's, I come back to, um, to, to, to Pierre's law of uh, pesticide impacts. Um, I actually, and I'll say something that will probably be uh, heresy for a lot of people there. I actually thought uh, especially, and I was there when it, it came through that glyphosate was not a bad herbicide. Okay. And compared to a lot of other herbicides out there, it is not. Uh, there are a lot of very bad actor herbicides that I can think of that, uh, you know, any far, far worse. The problem comes when you want to apply it to every acre, hectare of farmland. Uh, in the world, uh, which is now the case with glyphosate. And then you could take a, a product, even if it's, you know, even totally benign or has a few possible effects, and you're going to have a problem. And pesticides, pesticides are made to kill something somewhere. I mean, by definition, there's the, the word side in there, uh, which means kill. And what you're doing is you're changing your 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 changing chemistry. You're now targeting possibly a different uh, subgroup of of life that you were before, unless you have something like uh, you know uh, an NPV neodymium virus uh, uh, insecticide that basically will take pine sawfly and pine sawfly only. I mean that's that's the scalpel. And as I say, we have. We, we have the technology to make scalpel, but it doesn't pay to sell scalpel. It pays to sell sledgehammers. So we come up with the glyphosate and say, ooh, we'll make our crops resistant to it through uh, GMO I'd like program. to say something to that as well from the microbiology aspect that there is a patent on glyphosate that um, is patented basically is antimicrobial, mm -hmm. which lists both gut flora and yeah. soil microbes that it's- Oh, totally. 
designed yeah. to kill. So um, I think a lot of times are even when you know we think is something less harmful, we still measure it exactly the same way over and over again, instead of looking at the bigger picture. So with glyphosate, I think it's probably a lot more harmful than people understand it to be in a different kind of way, just like um, a lot of pesticides are. And I, I do want to say too something about scalpels, because even mosquitoes, which we see as being a big problem because mm -hmm. of malaria, if we were to remove all mosquitoes off the planet, do we even think about what the larva does in the water? Sure. No, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Having said that, I'm happy that I don't live in one of those countries with high rates of malaria. No, mm -hmm. I mean, so yes, uh, at, at some point, I think, uh, and I've, I, you know, been long enough, you have to accept that if we want to have our species dominate this planet and the numbers that they do, <laughs> um then then people will do things to prevent themselves and to 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 uh to protect themselves and and it's not all benign and then I, I, totally, I, to, I totally agree with you yeah i think it's a different way of thinking because yep. when it comes to food production too if we stop food waste we'd have plenty of food for everybody uh, to eat absolutely and i think we know that now so it's mm -hmm. like i just don't see the justification for not looking a little harder about whether we should use a pesticide period mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. first place I think that's where a lot of problems start. With neonics, I've been seeing too that there's an indication in science that we actually wipe out some other, um, what's the word, um, predators to slugs, for example. Oh, and, um, the impact of, of oh, insecticides. Hold on, folks, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cheryl has a couple of other questions that she's going to pose. But in the meantime, we have another, you know, quite a few other people. That yeah, I'd like to give people a chance. I think I've, I've said enough. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank so next is, next is going to be Ruth Waldick, then Ralph Martin, and then Thibault Rem. Um, so Ruth, would you go ahead with yours? Uh, I'm not getting the sound. No, I, I'm not sure whether she's still here or not. I, I see her in the middle of my screen, but I'm not hearing her. Okay, well, Ruth it has to okay, turn I on. Can on you. Is this uh -huh. working? Yeah, now it is. Okay, I just took off my headphones. There's a problem there. So yes, so I'm Ruth Waldick, and uh, I'm on Salt Spring as well. I do. I'm an ecologist who studies the impacts of of uh, extreme weather, so that aspect of climate change and. Um, I've been involved in a lot of policy in the past. I'm going to be quick because I see there's a lot of really good policy questions coming up here. Um, my question has to do, so shifting towards policy and in Canada here, recognizing that the industry is behind this. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about farm size. And so is part of the reason that we've got a problem in Canada that our farm size is just simply so large that it is easy to dismiss it as a, a, there's no potential to really monitor effectively. And, and they're essentially large deserts um, anyway. So to what extent is it the size of a field that is driving this reluctance to move away from pesticides or even to moderate the extent to which they use uh, pesticides versus the particular crop? that uh, the varieties that they are planting or the particular crops that are being planted? Um, well, in my opinion, and I'm sure there are people listening to us now that probably have more experience on, on, on that side of things, but I, I think you're right. I mean, field size is a large part of the problem. It's, the, it's, it's part of the uh, sort of industrial, uh, the, the way we've treated agriculture as, as, as an industry. Uh, when you have when you have a field uh, in the you know hundreds of thousands of hectares, scouting that field and being able to react to a pest problem in time to save your crop becomes increasingly well. A a the field is probably more prone to attack because it's such a large yummy food source all all there at once. And then B, you, the farmer, being able to react to a problem is, is that much less if, if you have a large field. And even by the time you, you're ready to start a spring, you've lost a large part of your crop or 
damage or reduce the value of a large part of your crop. So undoubtedly, yes, that is that is very true. If you want to go right back to the other extreme, insect control uh, in some cases was being in, in a small family farm uh, was carried out by the kids before they went to school every day. They'd have to spend so many so much time on their rows of potatoes taking out the potato beetles, uh, and then they could go to school. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, you've got, and then you've got everything in between. But yes, uh, the scale of agriculture, uh, the fact that the decisions are not made at the local level anymore. Yes. A lot of the farming that we have is, is contracted out. Uh, if you grow, uh, if you grow sugar beets, it's, it's, uh, it's the sugar beet, uh, buyer at the one company. If you grow cranberries, it's, uh, Ocean Spray or just the name. Yeah. name. And, and it's, and, so, and they so, decide, they decide that uh, they, you will apply this and that on that date and that and that and that and that as insurance and you have no choice in the matter. Right. So, so just one, one quick question, which is relating this back to climate change. And by that, I'll just let everyone know that I mean really extreme weather. So weather extremes, which are, which, in, which can be quite subtle in terms of agriculture. So given this and given that large fields can be insured, whereas small farms cannot be insured um, through, uh, through our agricultural um, framework here in Canada. Um, then there's another piece to this, which is as we get more intense heavy rainfall and wind events, then th what is the extent to which groundwater, especially on these large fields, the groundwater supplies are gonna be contaminated and that the materials are going to uh, have surface flow and airborne um, uh, distribution. And then is that another way, uh, another lens to criticize or to measure the potential impacts through groundwater contamination, et cetera, for these large fields? Hmm. Well, I, yeah, in some cases, I'm not sure that a, um, a heavier rain will necessarily mean more groundwater infiltration. In fact, it may be more runoff would be uh, the main problem that I would see. Uh, one of the things that's been known for a long time is that we're losing a lot of our soil. Uh, now, it was through wind uh, with the, the big culprit that was identified you know, back in the, in the 40s, of course, and, uh, but also water. So when we have these massive events, be they, uh, be they wind or rain, then we're going to be losing a lot of the soil layer uh, of the farm. So that, from a pesticide point of view, that has some interesting uh, ramifications because there, there are groups of pesticides which are not very mobile. I mean, synthetic pyrethroids, for instance, they're, they're very hydrophobic. Uh, you don't expect them to run off to, to a large extent into bodies of water, which is good because they're extremely toxic to aquatic organisms. Uh, but if you have a heavy rain or poor soil management on your farm and you actually lose a lot of the soil, then a lot of the material will be carried over into, into the nearby uh, creeks and, and ponds and lakes and, and, and at that point be re, remobilized and reuptake. So, so what it does you know, you, yeah, you do have to be cognizant of changing weather conditions and how that is going to affect, I think, primarily the transport of the various products that you're using. Okay, can we move on? And so, Ralph Martin, John Mayer, I missed you. You're going to be after uh, Tiabo. So, Ralph Martin, could you turn on your mic and ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm... Um, the founding director of the Organic Agriculture Center of Canada, based in Dalhousie, recently retired from the University of Guelph. I'm an agronomist. Um, a few years ago, I read a paper um, indicating that neonix had a negative impact on arthropods and other soil organisms, but I haven't kept up with the literature. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, earth, from, from earthworms on, on down, they are, they are very broadly toxic. And of course, they are, they are in the soil. Um, so and that's how they're applied. In many cases, uh, they're applied as a drench. They're applied uh, on, on coated seed in many cases. So uh, they, they, they are very toxic to, to soil arthropods, as they are to insects and aquatic uh, invertebrates. Okay, um, so I have um, 
Theobald Ron, but or Rem, but I don't see that he's still with us. If you're still with us, would you turn on your um, mic and ask your question, please? I'm going to assume that he has departed. So John Mayer. Yeah, okay, I'm trying to get my video on here and uh, there we go. Okay, uh, from the weeds to out of the weeds, a uh, broad question, uh, just the justification for uh, the uh, uh, all the chemicals uh, you've been discussing is to increase output, food output. Uh, and undoubtedly the pushback you would get uh, to the work that you do is uh, based on uh, a decline in output if they don't use these chemicals. Do you have any, uh, uh, can you throw any numbers at us in terms of uh, what the fall, what the decline in, in output would be uh, of uh, our uh, specific crops more sensitive? Um, and how would that output uh, be made up if, if it could be made up in terms of uh, additional energy or, uh, or time inputs? For, for neonics in particular, the bulk of the use um, is on a few crops, corn, soybean, as seed treatments, if you look at the, the, the total mass of chemical that is used. And by, by most reckoning now from uh, the agronomists who have uh, looked at it uh, independently, and with even, uh, even the US EPA agreed with those findings, the loss of the, uh, those chemicals in those crops would mean a total crop uh, loss of zero. The, the bulk of the neonics currently uh, are used where they don't need to be used. Now, would, will every farmer not have some crop damage if they don't use a neonic? No, of course not. Are there better ways of ensuring that that individual uh, through crop insurance or whatever, if it's only 10% of the, uh, the farm field that actually need the product, why use it over 100% of the area? And the reason for that is, is you, because the company can, because if you want seed, you have to accept the fact that it's going to be treated. Uh, farmers who are uh, looking for untreated seed are having a heck of a time finding the, the variety they're looking for with the characteristics they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, the best material is basically uh, sent to the treatment plant and it arrives fully loaded uh, with, with the neonic, whether you want it or not. In fact, there have been surveys done where uh, a large proportion of farmers don't even know that they're, uh, that they're applying the insecticide. Okay, okay, thanks very much. So there are a number of people that are in line to ask a second and third question, but I'm just gonna move down my list a little bit and let other people have their first question before going back. So Paul Beckwith, do you have a question? Well, okay, I'm going to move on then. Um, Antoine Safer, can you turn on your mic and ask your question, please? Um, I have the question, um, how do you think we are getting along with uh, regulations? Because um, the system is broken and uh, it is broken not only in Europe, not only in the US, it's uh, practically everywhere in the world. Uh, Japan, wherever I look, we have no appropriate assessment uh, in terms of public health. And that is a, a big gap I see. Yeah. <laughs> how can we, um, how I, can we fill that gap? Yeah, I, that is I, the question. I, I would agree. I I I I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing reports now, and I'm looking at the evidence. Um, even in Canada, uh, there has been people may be aware of this, but there's been a complete shift 
uh, in the uh, PMRA's position with regards to Neonix. Uh, they came out a few years ago saying that um, they were just too toxic to the aquatic environment and they were just too uh, present. Um, you know, that was not acceptable. That was a, their proposed decision was to, to ban them for those reasons, um, let alone the pollinators and, and the bees. And uh, all of a sudden, what, two years later, then that whole, their whole position is reversed. They tinker with the, tinker with the numbers and they say, oh, well, no, 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 now it's, it's, it's safe now. Well, we, we predicted it's safe, even though there's actually a lot of field evidence that it, it, they were clearly right the first time. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Um, it's not the only regulatory uh, body that has uh, that will have done that. EPA recently did also an about face on uh, on neonics, and uh, it's you know there's a massive pressure, you know, from industry. Um, and that pressure can take many forms, and uh, as I say, I was in the registration system for a number of years, and I was able to see firsthand. Um, how that pressure sometimes works. Um, one, 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 one small anecdote where, you know, a, a product um, used on wheat, uh, the, the health, my health colleagues sitting next to me at the table were saying, we don't have any safety information on this, none, zero. Might as well be a, a, a you know, developing country. <laughs> and, uh, we, we need we need something on this compound before you know we um, and it was already being used this is a review of older products and uh, essentially the answer came back from the company uh, was that well if you force us to generate data on this compound we're pulling it out of the Canadian market let you see can let you Canada see how you can export your wheat abroad if you can't use our product it was just blackmail, pure and simple. It worked. Happy thought. Uh, may I give a short response to that? I think uh, that we have a big gap in terms of uh, independent scientific evidence and evidence of sound quality. So the uh, privately financed studies are really uh, wealthy funded. And we see very little funding for public and independent scientists. We see a lot of pressure from the uh, companies and the chemical companies uh, govern the world food and the world feeding. And uh, that is a truth we should acknowledge. And what we need is some else methods which are long practiced and long known, but better documented, better advertised, better brought to the minds of the farmers and of the public. Because I think that is the only way to counter the pressure from industry. Yeah, can I, can I just respond and we quickly need, to that? Uh, methods to help the farmers. One interesting point that I'm seeing now is that uh, regulatory uh, bodies are rejecting uh, information uh, in peer-reviewed journals because they're saying, well, we, we don't have the raw data. Uh, we don't have the exact lat long of those fields. We don't, we can't redo the analysis. Uh, you know, with some journals now, the, all of the data is actually being uh, is in there in repository, but that's certainly not the case for, for every journal and certainly not going back in time. So, so I, I found that now they're using the lack of rigor as, uh, an excuse to not accept a number of the data coming from independent researchers. And more and more, the only data they find acceptable is that which is generated by industry. Okay, so uh, can we move on? 
Hardy Kern, could you turn on your mic and video? And Bill Tyson, you'll be after Hardy. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Minot, for all of your thoughts today. And I've been, so let me get at a less awkward angle. That's better. Um, I'm the new director of government relations for the American Bird Conservancy. And I've been reading a lot of your work about neonics and their effect on birds and in the rest of the trophic cascade. It's been really helpful to build a foundational knowledge. And I wanted to ask if you would expect to see a buildup of neonics from bats into raptors like Swainson's hawks that might be feeding on bats if the bats are affected. Would you expect to see that show up um, like we did with raptors with DDT and pelicans? No. No? No. No, they, they are, they are uh, because they are metabolized um quite quite readily so you will not have uh bio uh, accumulation or biomagnification the way you had with uh either ddt or the cyclodiene uh, insecticide they're 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 far too uh yeah i mean all these other compounds were all hydrophobic um and and bioaccumulatory um these these ones are not now having having said that they will in, in soils it's a different um it's a different story and I, I remember in the early days, a colleague in Environment Canada was trying to make the case that when imidacloprid was still was being presented as a first neonic, that maybe we should look at it as a track one contaminant, which under uh, UN legislation means you know toxic persistence and uh, toxic persistence and what there's a third one, and uh, you know it felt that there was a case to be made there that was persistent enough in soils uh to to match uh, that criterion but of course when it gets into to uh to a body to, uh, to no it's not going to be passed on to uh to predators good to know thank you so much thank you for your time sir no no I, I, having said that um a, a lot of the a lot of the secondary toxicity that we saw um with other fast metabolized compounds like opiates and carbamates was not because of an accumulation of residues in the body as you have now with uh, you know with endocytes as you have with, with some you had with the organochlorines it was because of the sheer amount of material that was contained in the gut content of the prey gotcha now so when you have uh, a, a, a concentrated source of material as you do sometimes on seed treatments if you've got a belly full of seeds, and if the predator eats your gut, eats your gut content, which is not always the case, some some predators, of course, eviscerate their prey. Uh, then you could run into problems that way, just by gotcha. the amount that's sitting there in the gut, but not not throughout the tissues. That's really good to know. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so Bill Tyson and Mike Nickerson, and we are about fifteen minutes away from wanting to wrap up the recorded uh, session. So if I have time, I'm going to go back through the list and get second comments from some of the other people. And in the meantime, Bill Tyson, would you ask your question? No, Bill Tyson. Mike Nickerson. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for all that information. It's good to know that these things are being delved into. Um, my question has been somewhat answered, but I, I'm been long saying that if people aren't prepared to put some effort, some elbow grease into agricultural processes, then we're dependent on chemicals or mechanical means. Uh, and you did mention not long after that, that there are certain breeding things that we can do with plants to make them resistant and so on. But if you've got other things to mention on how else we can deal with pesticides besides uh, labor. Yeah. Um... Well, in many cases, so there, there's, I, I actually strongly believe that there, probably, there is a room for, for a pesticide out there. I mean, it, it, it's hard to keep up with some pests, uh, especially at the scale that we have to grow crops uh, to, to, to feed our population. Having said that, we could, we could stand in and really is case by case, pest by pest, crop by crop basis. There are a lot of ways, there's a lot of wisdom out there on 
uh, you know, not not rejecting the, the decades of agricultural improvements that we've made, but looking at the you know where we've gone wrong, and uh, you know, scale was mentioned as as, as one big factor. Uh, a lot of things you can do with elbow grease on uh, on an acre that you cannot do on 150 acre or quarter section field or whatever. So 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 there are a number of of, of, of things out there. There is a number of social constructs. I, I I still come back to a really fantastic presentation I had seen uh, way back when. So we used to use granular formulations or organophosphorus insecticides all over cornfields in Ontario, where I was at the time. And it was probably that way of uh, delivering pesticides was probably having one of the most uh, acute impact on birds. Uh, because the the uh, the pesticides were applied on little inert particle that could be sand, it could be uh, grit, little, and that you know basically birds could pick up as grit. Birds needing grit, uh, seed eating birds need, needing grit to digest. So so there's evidence that this was having a horrendous impact. We're again, it was like the neonext. It was a prophylactic use. It was being used where we didn't necessarily need it maybe it was i remember in the numbers at the time less than 15 percent of the crop uh and it was predictable there was a client from west to east as to where we actually had problems with things like corn rootworm that were being controlled by by these granulars well for one thing corn rootworm comes about when you don't rotate your crop so that's the first the first easy answer there was that well if you rotated your crop a little more you wouldn't have press problems to start with. You wouldn't have to use these products. Uh, but then, if the course, the price of corn was high on the Chicago market, all of a sudden they wanted to grow corn. They didn't want to grow something else. That that's where the money was for that year, right? And that's how farming decisions are made. So there was a student uh, who had talked at one of the conferences at, uh, at Guelph, saying, "Hey, if we instituted an insurance system," And he had costed all out. He was an economist, uh, and he costed all out an insurance system that allowed farmers to pay in to to the system and get compensation if they happened to be in the field where uh, they, they they were they were attacked. The whole system would pay for itself, and the farmers would pay spend less than they were currently spending on chemicals. I thought brilliant. Why doesn't everybody do it that way? Uh, never heard of the guy since. Even I think somebody put a lid on him. <laughs> it was just this was heresy, communism. It's whatever you want to call it. Uh, that that whole train of thought was shut down. I thought it was brilliant. It would have saved millions of songbirds. Okay, I had hoped to be able to give Cheryl McCumsey another go round, but it looks like she has just departed. So Ruth Waldick, have you got anything else that you would like to add? And Meg Sears, you're going to have last comment. No, no, thank you, Phil. Okay, uh, Dave Doherty, you had something you wanted to put in. Yeah, I wanted to know if there's any evidence that exposure to neonicotinoids possibly in combination with other things at extremely low levels is obesogenic in, in people and, and particularly um, whether it might be linked to the obesity epidemic in the United States. Yeah, I, I, can, I can't say, I can't tell you that. What I can say is I, I had in one of my slides is that certainly in, in rodents, uh, there is some evidence out there that can affect uh, lipogenesis. Um, that uh, the issue of, of obesity and, and chemicals in the food supply has been uh, made with a number of different um, chemicals out there. So, uh, you know, but it, it's not really, uh, it's not really my area. So I'll, I'll stop there. But there, there's information out there that uh, indicates that it's, it's perhaps uh, something that needs to be looked at as as are a lot of other, um, sort of, you know, endocrine-related um, issues. The 
what we have now though is a system that does not really deal with some of these uh potential impacts very well it was like the comment that was made about uh, glyphosate and the impact on on, on gut uh, flora those are not part of the regular uh, range of studies that a health department will look at when deciding whether to approve or not approve uh, the chemical. Uh, again, you know, you, you could some of these things could be uh, could be happening and might have minor effects if we weren't using so much, if we weren't sloshing around these so much of these pesticides around. Uh, I mean, many times for, 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 for no good reason, as I pointed out. Um, so again, it's a question of quantity and, and exposure level. Now, in the case of neonix, we're being exposed to um, higher levels than we would normally because they are less acutely toxic. And um, the, 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 the data I talked about from, from Japan was interesting. So there was a case where um, they thought that main exposure was through drinking tea, green tea. Uh, if you've had Japanese green tea, uh, you know, this has with, you know, rose petals and, and various other flower parts, and spices and so on. If you consider that, for instance, every single one of these ingredients has been treated with a neonic, perhaps several times, perhaps several different neonics, then each of these commodities is brought in. They're all under acceptable residue limits they're all dried which concentrates everything you take the whole mess and you put it in your teacup and you add some water to it and i mean woof, all of a sudden uh everything gets released into your teacup and then people are showing up uh to their doctors with with hand tremors because and they say it started when i started drinking my green tea <laughs> mm -hmm. thank you Okay, Would it be so possible for me to put in a comment here because you didn't call me? So uh, yes, I'm go ahead. Paula Drudis, and I started the Saskatchewan Network for Alternatives to Pesticides after I got poisoned by pesticides and got very sick from them. Anyway, a lot of the questions people ask here, there are answers for these questions on my website, and it's www.snapinfo.ca. And I have stuff about water, about health, about neonics. I have a huge page on neonics. I have a lot of effects on all the different um, organisms and groups and stuff. But I had a particular question here regarding canola. My understanding is that our canola, we have a lot of canola here and it's spreading south all the time. And, um, uh, you know, like people are saying, there isn't as many effects on bees or things from the canola seed that has been treated as there is from corn seed. And I could never quite understand that. And I was just wondering if you had uh, anything more specific on that. Uh, yeah, the, the reason people say that is that the, uh, the concentration of neonic on the seed is is clearly lower for canola than it is for corn is more less oh okay the concentration is lower so so you have less less material um so uh you know but having said that of course the plant itself is very attractive to pollinators and um mm. I, I still think I, I have a real issue with the pollinator risk assessments that were done by EPA and PMRA. I think they have grossly, and I, that's detailed in one of the reports uh, that I did on seed treatments for, for California, uh, where I go through the current assessment of pollinator risk, where I think they've, they've gone seriously wrong in their assessment. So I think the impacts are, are much higher than, than I thought. Well, I can tell you observationally, we have a community garden, which is not perhaps within, well, within a quarter mile of, of fields. And um, in the last few years, and I've always had issues with potato beetles, not in mine, mostly in everybody else's garden, and they would come over. Uh, certainly um, flea beetles, um, cabbage worms. The last few years, for heaven's sake, I haven't seen the cabbage worm moth 
or butterflies until the late late July. So it, I, I can see a tremendous difference in what there is at the community garden. And it's not because we do anything because most people are chemical free there, but it's just, you know, carrying from the main fields. The main, you know, in most years when they would cut the canola, then if you had any uncovered cold crops, well, you know, good luck because the flea beetles would come and cover everything, turn everything black. That didn't happen this year. It just didn't. That's okay. I put a row cover on mine so they can't go to the row cover and my stuff is okay. But I've noticed that there's been a tremendous decrease in what you call pest insects or whatever of all kinds all of a sudden. In well, the if, last you, if you look at the, the main data, um, well, the original data that pointed to invertebrate reduction, uh, yeah. It was from this this nature organization in Germany, and it was long term data, which we have very little yeah. of when it comes to insects. And most of the data was from nature reserves. Uh, yeah. But the one thing that these nature reserves all had in common, of course, being being Europe, uh, surrounded you know, by uh, agriculture, they're all surrounded by yeah. by agriculture. And in terms, some people have asked questions about water. We have one study in Saskatchewan that was done by the Wildlife Service where they happened to have monitoring stations on one watershed. And there was a super storm that came in, 12 inches of rain in 12 hours. And they measured 200 and over 240 kilograms of pesticides both in dust and in water in that small watershed that came in with, uh, with the storm. And they figured some of it was even two, four, five feet because the air masses came from the Pacific and from Central America and they joined and came up together and dumped all the crap here. <laughs> there is nowhere that is safe from that stuff, unfortunately. And that's also something I have on the website. But my other no, question we, is, will this be taped? And is there any way I could refer to it or, or reference it on my website? Yes, it's all taped and you can gain access to it after, uh, probably after this evening. Okay. Yeah. Well, long range I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I missed you, Paula, my, my error. No problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, Meg, do you want to have the last few minutes? Uh, try to keep it to two minutes. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. This has been really tremendous. Um, first of all, I wanted to point out that the PMRA had its knuckles slapped fairly soundly before um, the last summer. So before the last election, the federal government did commit to revising the, the act and the PMRA is now very busily um, uh, trying to change things up and, and I think um, would like to avoid legislative changes, which is, would be most unfortunate. There's also a science advisory committee that they're recruiting for. This will be volunteer, which is um, a pretty heavy workload for volunteers. Um, but I put the link in the, um, in the in the chat there. And um, I, I just wanted to ask you the, um, in, ter you know, in terms of what the regulators actually look at, absolutely with Prevent Cancer Now, we're very concerned about the microbiome and lots of different um, chemicals affect that. There are also a lot of endocrine disruptors. So, um, we're getting a lot of endocrine disruptors in plastics and additives to plastics and so on. So when we have so many chemicals with similar um, effects, similar adverse effects, how are, you know, basically our approach is to say, you don't use it unless it's absolutely necessary and use least toxic approaches, but that's not the way that things are going. Can you make any suggestions about sort of first steps to turn a corner on these? Um, because like the regulators, they can't pin obesity on one particular chemical when there are literally a thousand of them that have, uh, effects on the diplocytes and on the microbiome and so on. Yeah, and, and uh, how no, do we nor can they, <laughs> nor in my opinion, can they properly manage any one chemical um, the way the way it's been going. 
So for, for a while, and I, I continue to, to work on this, I, I sort of given up on regulatory uh, <laughs> bodies. Uh, just, just, yeah, because I didn't think that was a worthwhile uh, place to be putting any effort. And uh, worked more on the, uh, if you wish, the, the commercial or the retail side. Um, so with the uh, IPM Institute uh, in the U.S., um, you know, for instance, for environmental uh, impact, came up with predictive algorithms, measurement systems that would allow one to put uh, the details of what they were intending to spray uh, or use on their field into the system and then calculate the potential impact on on insects, on aquatic systems, on birds, small mammals, and, and so on. In a in a you know somewhat simplistic way, but way more uh, integrated than than what is is currently done. And uh, the the system has had some uh, take up. Um, um, I know I can say that, uh, for instance, uh, Whole Foods uh, US uh, was using the system. For a while before they got bought by Amazon, and Amazon decided they didn't weren't interested in that. Um, they were using the system to help in advising their uh, supply chain, because in, and and then, and then the the whole idea there was to to hit the system, the food distribution system, where they they have control over uh, their their supply chain, so they can go back, they can look at the data, and they have the data. They can well. They can demand the data from their farmers uh, as to what they're using. They can have that data analyzed by people such as ourselves. And then whenever you do that, uh, you find that, in fact, in an agricultural landscape, you've got maybe 5% of the farmers causing you know, 80% of the impact because they're clearly not with it. Um, and so the idea there is to use peer pressure and say, hey, why don't you go and talk to Joe, who's just down the road from you? He seems to be able to be growing the same crop, and you're using only a small fraction of what you're using. So that was. Can, I, the, can I ask for a wrap up here? Yeah. So the the, the wrap up is there. Are, there are ways to to proceed. I'm not sure that that way will include uh, re uh, rejigging PMRA or other regulatory body because I think that that's been shown to be a rather uh, pointless pursuit over the last decade. So with this, from me, my personal thank you to you, Pierre, and to the audience for asking the questions. It's been a chore managing all of this because there have been so many interesting questions that uh, people wanted to ask. But uh, keep in mind that those people that want to stay behind to, once the recording stops, we're going to continue to have an open discussion with people that want to stay with us. And at this point, I'm the going hardcore. to- The hardcore. The hardcore. <laughs> so I'm, at this point, I'm going to ask uh, that the final thank you be offered by our uh, board president, Jean Doherty. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of KCOR, I would really like to thank you very much for, uh, Pierre, for giving such a, a thorough presentation on such a complicated subject. It's something that uh, is of interest to me um, because as a biologist in training a long time ago, all of a sudden I started to hear about some of these problems and, and it, I, I just got lost in all of the, all of the uh, information that was coming out. It seemed very, very complicated, but what you were able to do today was to make it a little better understood on my part anyway. So on behalf of KCOR and um, Everyone, I would like to thank you for giving the presentation. For those of you who are still here and have never been to one of our presentations before, I would uh, strongly recommend that you go to our website, CanadianCore.com, and you will be able to register for the Stay Informed session at, section of that. And if you do, then you will be getting all of the uh, notices of things like where to go to find this particular talk and any future presentations that are going to be coming up. I would also say that if you're interested in um, our Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, our website also has um, how to become a member and you would be able to um, uh, join us if, if that's of interest to you. So with that, I would like to say thank you again 
and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you again.